Anyone who goes to an astrologer believes in fate. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. They think there's this predestined course of existence awaiting them for good and ill. And people come to an astrologer with the hope that good fate is just right around the corner. However, just as likely, bad fate is just around the corner. Because the one thing we truly know about fate is it goes up and it goes down. You have the good days and the bad days in everything in your life. Sure, some people have more extremely good days and their downs aren't as bad, and some people have extremely bad days and their goods aren't as high. But it's always going to be going up and down. There is no stability to fate. It's always going to be up and down. So in coming to an astrologer, a person has the belief that fate exists. Yet, a person, when they hear a bad prediction, becomes fearful or depressed about that fate. Now think about it. Isn't that a contradiction? To believe in fate, believe that there's this plan for one's life, and then upon hearing that plan, to become depressed or fearful of that plan. Does that make sense? Well, that's kind of like an actor, like say Angelina Jolie, who gets her script and says, oh, this is my movie. Oh no, in act four, scene three, my husband gets shot and goes into depression, right? Instead of saying, oh, in act four, scene five, my husband gets shot and I'm going to make do the best I can in that situation. I'm going to play that role as perfectly as possible. That's how an actor does it, right? Well, that's how we're meant to do it, too. If there is a divine plan with its tragedies and its boons, then it's our job to live that divine plan, right? Okay, so if you believe in faith, you should also learn to believe in living that faith and not having a fear of that faith. Why? Because every step in life that you take is not an ending. It's just one step leading to the next step. So, in Act 5, Scene 3, Angelina Jolie's husband in the movie gets killed. Okay? Well, in Act 7, she meets a hot super spy who helps her avenge her husband, who she then falls in love with and is happier than ever. Okay? Same in life. Bad things happen, but they're the stepping stones that get us to the next part of our life. And eventually, the stepping stone will be a good one. And then that good stepping stone might lead to another good stepping stone. And that good stepping stone leads us to a bad stepping stone. Okay, so maybe Angelina Jolie finds this new boyfriend, falls in love with the end of the movie. Then they make part two of the movie. And in part two of the movie, the boyfriend's gone. Why? Well, because after six months of dating, they hated each other and just had fights and broke up. So, the nice stepping stone led to another tragedy. And that's how life is. It's a series of steps. Enjoyable steps, painful steps. And all those steps are taking us to one critical place in life. And that is our death. Okay? And God, when He creates this world, He doesn't sign a contract with you to say, Okay, I'm going to give you all the best things in your life. Based on your karmas and your actions, I'm going to set you up to be as happy as possible. That's not the deal. What God does is, He says, I'm going to set your life up so that the day you die, you'll be the most evolved possible, okay? And therefore, ensure the greatest long-term happiness. Because he knows any happiness on earth is just short-term, it's just one step. One step into love, one step into fighting, one step into not fighting, one step into seeing your spouse get a disease. It's never going to be a permanent happiness. So God arranges our fate in such a way so that at the time of our expiration, we're the most evolved possible, given the faith that we have to suffer. So we need to embrace our faith, okay? And that requires a spirit of sacrifice, which is the sun. Where's my sun here? The sun. The sun is a spirit of sacrifice. It's the sacrifices we make in life in order to evolve and grow to spirit. That's why the sun is a cruel planet or a malefic, because it will hurt things, because some things need to be sacrificed. So, we need to live our life with a spiritual sacrifice to understand that the only thing that's eternal is the sun or the soul. The sun is the soul. And that the culmination of life is how much in touch we are with that soul nature, which is reflected in how much we are in touch with God and everything that surrounds us. And that's 
the purpose of life. That's the sun. That's the center of every person's universe. And so by staying attached to that center, we can have happiness in all of our situations. By being detached from that center and attached to other things, we'll be suffering up and downs. Meaning we'll have great ups, but they'll always be followed by downs. It's just the nature of life. Okay, so we want to understand that if we believe in destiny, we should embrace our destiny. Okay, we should play our destiny as best as possible. But that doesn't mean we should be limited by our destiny, because there's also something called free will. So how do these two things work out, fate and free will? Well, 75% of our lives is fated which means 75% of the things that happen in your life are indicated in your horoscope. So if you go to the best astrologer, super astrologer in the world, who is enlightened, like Sri Yukteswar, and he spent 15 years working on your horoscope and worked out every single event, the most minute to the largest event in your life, he would write a huge book that was exactly 75% of the events that happen in your life. Okay? And then there'd be 25% of your life that wouldn't be in that book. All right? 75% of your life is faded, which means it's in the horoscope. So the best astrologer can only predict 75% of the things that are going to happen in your life. The other 25% are simply not in your chart. However, 100% of this, 100% of that 75% is destined to happen in your life, happen in your life, if the astrologer is correct, okay? If he's incorrect, it doesn't mean necessarily that the 25% changed that, it means he made a mistake and didn't predict 100% of your life correct. But if he does predict 100% of your life correct, he will still only predict 75% of your life. That gives a 25% room for what I call wiggling room, or free will, okay? Free will is a whopping 25% of what happens in your life, okay? And this comes from, um, you know, Sri Yukteswar Yogananda, who've spoken on this type of thing. So the remaining 25% of your life is in accordance with free will. Okay? <clears throat> now, free will is a tricky thing though. Alright, a lot of times, the majority of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, when people think they're using free will, they're actually not. They're simply following the dictates of their horoscope. And they say, I'm different now. I do things differently than I did 10 years ago. And we say, yes. That's not because of free will. That's because you're in a planetary period that's different, and this planet is motivating your actions now. But you're still following the dictates of fate. So, most of the time when people think they're using their free will, they're not. They're following the dictates of their changing fate. Now, the tricky thing about free will is that most people behave in a certain way and have certain habits, and we all do. We're creatures of habits and behavior. And that habit, those habits and behaviors are reflected in the horoscope. They're shown in the chart. And if one continues to follow those habits and behaviors, then all their life becomes astrologically faded. All their life becomes faded due to following the habits of fate. So, for instance, as a very simple example, Let's say in my past life, every time somebody insulted me, I would fight them and take their head, like I challenge them to a duel. Even if the insult was an accident and no harm was meant. So I take like a hundred heads last lifetime in duels. In this lifetime I have all these enemies, you know, people who are angry at me for taking their husband's heads and, you know, or taking their own heads at, at things that weren't even worth fighting over. Okay. So in this lifetime, I have all these enemies, all these people who are angry at me and, and who want to get revenge on me. So these people, when they see me in this lifetime, they're going to be mean to me and they're going to insult me. 
So in this lifetime, I have the choice. Do I follow the behaviors dictated in my previous existence and my horoscope of having a chip on my shoulder and every time I get insulted to get um, angry and fight them or every, if someone causes me the slightest grief, I take them to court? Or do I just forgive them the slight or insult, harbor love in my heart for them and move on? If I continue to do the first thing, I just follow the dictates of my faith, I create more of the similar karmas, and I have continue to have the same miserable existence littered with enemies and insults for the remaining lifetimes until I choose to change them. Okay? So, if we want to escape our faith, we have to use our free will at 25% to behave in ways that are not bringing the ill fate to us. We have to behave properly. We have to know how to live. Okay? That's why gurus, spiritual traditions, religions all give us a cornerstones of how to live. In yoga we have yama and niyama. Christians have the Ten Commandments. Muslims have a whole set of prescriptions and postscriptions. So every religion has these things, do's and don'ts, to how to live. And by living in according to those, even when it's not fair, is how one exerts their free will. Okay? If one lives in accordance with those things only when it's easy and fair, but when it's unfair, they resort to those negative things, then they're following the dictates of their horoscope, of their fate, and they'll continue to have the same type of fated existence. And then 100% of life is astrologically determinable. In its essence, there is no free will. Okay? <clears throat> All right. However, if one uses free will, amazing things can happen. Okay, now why is that? Well, 25% is free will, 75% is fated. That seems like a stacked deck, doesn't it? But there's a divine rule that says, if for whatever effort you make in self-improvement or in betterment, or to do the right thing, God will pay you back three times as much. So, if you do one thing, God is going to do three things to help you. If you do one thing to make yourself better, God will take care of three things to make you better. And that equals four things. So, if we do 25% of free will, God will do three times 25% which is 75% of improvement for us. So with 25% of free will, one has the power to change all their faith. Now that's the kind of math I like. Okay? But we know it's not that easy, is it? Why isn't it that easy? Well, the reason it's not that easy is because you have to use 100% of your free will, 100% of the time. And then God will do, take care of this 75%, 100% of the time. But, if you only do the right thing that's contrary to your evil nature, one out of ten times, that means you're really only getting 2.5%. So say, getting back to the lifetime of taking heads and dueling and having that quality in this lifetime, my hypothetical life that I created. I don't have that lifetime that I know. I'm just creating a hypothetical situation. If one out of ten times somebody insults me and I don't fight them, then I'm using 2.5% of free will. Okay? So God will help me with those issues. A little more, 7.5%, three times that. So then 10% of my life will be changed. But I'm still going to be stuck with 65% bad faith in that context. Okay? So, to truly change your faith, you have to apply your free will every time, all the time, 100% of the time. You can't be selfish half the time and selfless the other half. Okay? It has to be 100% of your 25% of your free will, which is 25% of your life. You understand? You have to do 100% and then God will take care of the full 
Now, how does this work? How does it work that 25% effort, or whatever effort you make, how does it work that God will help three times that? All right, so if you do 1%, he'll do 3%, which equals 4%. Or if you do 25%, he'll do 75%, and that equals 100%, and you're set. That's based on the five elements. What are the five elements? Well, we have the sun and the moon. The atma, the soul, and the manas, the mind, which we'll talk about more. And underneath these guys, we've got the five elements. The easiest way to understand the five elements is through the senses. Each element gives us a sense. Fire is our sight. Air is our touch. Earth is our sense of smell. Water is our sense of taste. And, and ether is our sense of hearing. Everything in our life is, we experience it because of our senses. Okay, we experience it through our cognitive senses, which are ruled and governed and created and fueled by the five elements. So it's the five elements that give us the illusion of this world in front of us by our, having our senses say, this tastes like an apple, this apple feels hard, this apple is red, um, and this apple sounds crunchy when I bite into it. That gives us the illusion of that apple. But really, what's happening? What is that apple really? That apple really is a manifestation of God. And we are a manifestation of God eating that apple. But our senses tell us that I'm a four-legged, four, two-armed, four-legged, two-legged creature with ten toes who's got soft hard parts and soft parts, who smells good in some places and bad in other places, who is this color, has blue eyes and blonde hair. So our senses are telling us that this is what it is through the five elements. But actually, everything in front of us that our senses are telling is this hard, soft, blue, red, green, and therefore given an identity to everything, is really just God manifesting himself. But the five elements cause us to think it is what it is, what we see in the physical concrete world. Okay? So everything is created through the five elements. Everything that is, is an admixture of the five elements, which gives us an admixture of sensory perceptions, which causes us to believe that thing is a certain thing that truly it's not. Because in fact, it's really just another manifestation of God. Okay? So all those five elements represent all of our existence. And the five elements work together. Like ether, out of ether comes air, and out of air comes fire, and out of fire comes water, and out of water comes earth. There's all these cycles. There's actually three ways the five elements work together. All right? Three ways that they work together. So if you twang or improve or fine-tune one element, that embedded element and all elements represent behaviors and needs and so on, that embedded element will influence three other elements. And so you get four things going for every one thing you fix. It's the same law. 25, if you do one share, God will do three shares. And that's based on the way the five elements work. If you want to understand that more, in my Graha Sutras book, I have a huge chapter, it's the biggest chapter in that book on the five elements, which are a cornerstone of astrology, astrology and a philosophy as well. So that's how it works. It's the divine law based upon the nature of which the five elements create the world. So, how does that work? Well, Venus is diplomacy, and it's also one of the elemental planets. Mars is your enemies, okay? Well, if I'm diplomatic... That's going to help, or if I'm graceful, which, you know, the quality of Venus, which diplomacy comes from, that'll help me with my enemies, right? And now my enemies are better, okay? And then the whole chain works. Everything starts shifting. So if you better one part of yourself, which is always an elemental part, one of your behaviors, because it's also the five elements that are the organs of action. The, our ability to act is based on the use of our five elements. Okay, there, the five elements also have something called organs of action. Movement, creating sound, are two of the organs of action. How much of our life is important upon the sounds we make, meaning the words that come out of our mouth? 
a huge part. If I improve my sound, the way I speak to people, it will improve everything in my life, right? If I improve how I move, that will help everything in my life. If I punch people, that won't be good. If I give my arm to old ladies as they cross the street and I move that way, I move in a way that will acquire merit. If I move in a way that helps people, and I give people back rubs when they have bad packs and things like that, I'll acquire more merit, right? So every action we take is we take through the organs of actions of the five elements. So our behaviors are also indicative by the five elements. So changing one behavior, which is an element, it helps three other elements. And, and so one action leads to fourfold results. And so if we do 100% of one action, that's 25% of free will applied to that one thing, we get 100% results. God will match us three parts to one. And honestly, that's the best deal going in the universe. Where else can you go and say, I'll give you 25 cents and you'll give me a dollar. That's what essentially is happening. Guys who do invest in stocks, They'll put down 25 cents and they're happy if they get 30 cents back. Then they're had a good day, all right? Because when they, bid, when they put in a million and they get a million and 50,000, they just made 50,000. That's a lot to make in one day. But God's even better than that. His plan of returns is better. You do one thing and he gives you three times that much. So you give him 25 cents, he gives you a dollar. You give him a million dollars, you get $4 million in F back. So whatever effort you make, he gives you the best returns out of any possibility on earth, okay? Even in the best relationship, if you give Ben a dollar, you might get a dollar and 10 back in the best relationship, right? Lots of times you put a dollar into a relationship and you get 80 cents back, right? God, you give him a dollar, you're gonna get four bucks back, okay? Because of how these five elements work. So in everything in your life, if you direct your behavior to improving something in your life that's a negative part of your fate, and you, every chance and every opportunity and every time you do the right thing, using 20, that free will, and you do that every time, then 100% of your problems will vaporize. Okay? <clears throat> Does everyone understand that? That's pretty cool. Now, to really utilize all this, though, utilize this, we have to understand what is will, okay? We have the five elements, which are our behaviors, the energy that causes us to have the strength to act, our organs of actions, and the sensory perceptions that describe for us all the things in our lives and fulfill our life with the countless things and people in it, okay? Then we have the sun and the moon. These are the planets of will. Okay? Those are the planets of will. So when it comes to changing our lives, we're using those planets. They're the king and the queen who are in charge of all the other planets and get to say, hey, Jupiter, go do this. Hey, Venus, go do this. All the other planets are there to serve the king and queen, essentially, which means to serve your will. All right. The sun is God's will. Okay, sun is the atma, it's the soul, the soul of the entire universe. It's God's will in your life. Okay, figure that. That's pretty heavy, right? The moon is ego will. Okay, sun is atma, the soul, where God's will resides. The moon is manas, the mind, and the mind means the the thing that takes in all perceptions and analyzes and cognizes and feels and interprets, you know, the very essence of our being is the moon, the mind is the mind, okay? It's not the mental mind so much as the mind within oneself that's found in the heart. Within manas, the mind, lives the jiva, which is the living being, the individualized living being, the part of you that's a separate, has a, an idea of separate existence from God. And that idea is called the ahamkara, the ego. So in the manas, the mind resides the jiva, along with ahamkara, the idea of separate existence, or the ego. So the moon has this idea that 
I'm an entity. I'm a self-existing entity. I don't exist in the context of a larger thing. I exist as an independent being, a jiva, a living being. That's what the ego is. This idea of separate existence that's separate from everything else. As a result of that, the moon, we say, is lovesick. It's craving love. It's craving connectivity. What is love? It's to be connected, right? The moon is craving to be connected. Why? Because it has within it the idea of separate existence. It feels separated from everything. And that's no fun. So the moon craves love and wants to bond to something greater than itself. And through that, overcome the pain of separate existence. Because being, the ego suffers. It will always suffer. It will never stop suffering because it is the idea of separate existence. And as long as there's separation between our consciousness and God's consciousness, there is pain and need that will not be fulfilled, that will only be temporarily fulfilled in an unsatisfactory way, right? So the moon is ego will. So these are our two planets of free will. These are the two planets that can do, that, that get to make and determine that 25% of life, okay? That, that, that missing 25%, how are they going to form it? And are they going to use that missing 25% of life and use that free will 100% of the time, and through that, have the best fate possible, or not? How do we do this? Well, free will is God's will flowing through us. Which is us, when we say us, I, my, or mine, or me, whenever we use that word, we're not talking about the sun, we're talking about the jiva, the individualized living being, which resides in the moon. We're talking about the moon. So, God's will is free will, or free will, we can say better, is God's will that flows through the ego will. Okay? It's God's will flowing through you as an individual being. It's God's will flowing through us as individual beings. That's what free will is. Free will is not ego will. Okay? Now how do you tell if you're talking of, if you're using your ego will or God's will? It's a really easy thing. Okay? If in talking or thinking about what you're going to do, if you use the word I, you're using ego will. So if you say I'm going to be liberated, you're using ego will. When you say I'm going to go and find a marriage partner, you're using ego will. When you say, I'm going to buy a new car, you're using ego will. When you say, I'm going to be the best musician in the world, you're using ego will. When you use ego will, you're following the dictates of your horoscope. If those dictates are prosperous and happy and indicative of love, great. But if those dictates are, are unfortunate, tragic, and lonely and isolated, you will suffer. Okay? So whenever you use the word I, you're using the ego will represented by the moon, and you will follow the dictates of your horoscope, and therefore 100% of your life will follow the dictates of your horoscope, not just 75%. Okay? So the trick is to get rid of the I. There's a great story in the Indian Puranas about the about Bali, who was an Ashura who became the king of the three worlds, of the heavens, the Netherlands, and earth. And this Ashura, fortunately, was a very devout person. And he used to say that there's only two sins. <coughs> Not like seven, like in the, in, in the Christian tradition, there's only two sins. There's the sin of I, and the sin of my. It's the sin of ego. It's the ego identification. That's the source of all of our misery, all of our selfishness, all of our bad behavior, and as a result, all the negative residual karma that we have to enjoy. Okay, the results of that karma. So, the trick is to get out of ego will and to let God's will flow through us. Okay, because that's what free will is. Free will is God's will flowing through one. And once one can do that, then that 25% of their life can take them anywhere. 
and we'll take them to the best possible place. So then the question is, how do I get out of ego will and instead follow the free will, which is really God's will flowing through us? Okay? To do that, you have to use the power of the ego, which is the moon. Okay? The power of the that's a thing that's history. You have to use the power of the moon. And like I said, the sun and moon are the planets of will. The moon is the ego will, which has no power to change fate. Like I said, if you use the I word, or the mind word, or the me, any of those words in your sentences of what you're going to do, you're following the egocentric will, which is simply following the dictates of fate indicated in your horoscope. And that's why when it comes to timing events in astrology, the dashas are based on the position of the moon. They're the moon tripling through the sky, triggering off all your planets through following the path set forth by those planetary wills. Because the ego has no power change anything or do anything beyond its fate. This is illustrated really well in the um, Mahabharata. All the characters in the Mahabharata symbolize different aspects of self in the, in the spiritual journey. One of the central figures is Bhishma. Okay. Bhishma in the Mahabharata symbolizes the ego. Okay? And you think, wait, how can that be? Bhishma is so great. Well, let's think about how Bhishma really was. And it's true, he was great. The ego is great. We need a healthy, strong ego, right? We need a great ego like Bhishma. We have to be heroic and valorous and truthful and noble and maintain our prop, uh, promises so that everyone respects us. We don't want to have low self-esteem and crawl on our bellies through our lives. That no one achieves spirituality through lack of self-esteem. Okay, we need to have a good, healthy, strong image. Self-image, a good, healthy ego. And Bhishma symbolizes that. Bhishma was the most powerful person in the Mahabharata outside of Krishna. He was the greatest warrior. He was the greatest statesman, the greatest diplomat, the greatest king. You name it, he was the best at it. He was extremely well trained. He was the son of the Ganga River, for crying out loud. You know, this amazing being. He was a deva born to be, to live a life on earth. He was cursed to live a life on earth. Okay? Yet, what could he really do in the Mahabharata? Nothing. He gave up his power to the throne, meaning he could not rule. And he gave up that power to the throne because his father wanted to be with another woman and she would only be with him if he guaranteed that her sons would be the next kings. And that led on to the Pandus. Okay? So he gave up his throne, which is his power to rule. Because it's the king, the son, the throne, that has the power to affect the kingdom. And instead he became a steward of the kingdom and promised always to serve whoever sat on the throne. So he ends up sitting on the throne. Who ends up sitting on the throne? Duryodhana who's kind of the culprit in the Mahabharata. The Pandus are the good guys and symbolize the five elements working together to achieve liberation. That's why there's five Pandus, one for each element. Then there's Krishna, who of course is the sun, the soul, the God figurehead in the Mahabharata. And then there's Bhishma, the moon, the ego, who has to serve who's ever on the throne. And who's on the throne? Duryodhana who, with his hundred brothers, which represent all the hundreds and hundreds of sense entanglements that mire in this world, they own the throne, therefore Bhishma has to serve them. He doesn't want to. He doesn't find it happy. He goes against doing what he really wishes to do. He has no power at all. He's the most pain figure in the Mahabharata because he has no power to do all the great right things he knows are the right thing to do. He's subservient to the king of the senses, the king of fate, to Duryodhana. Duryodhana. However, he has one thing that makes him incredible. And the key to the Mahabharata 
and the key to, not necessarily the key to the whole Mahabharata, but the key to our existence and spiritual development and the use of our free will. And that is, he has the boon of willful death. He can choose when he will die. He gained that power when he renounced ever touching a woman because his father's soon-to-be wife wanted to make sure he never had a woman because if he had a woman, he might have an offspring and that offspring might say, I get the throne and try to take it away from her kids. So he swore to never even, to get, first he said, I'll never get married. And she said, that's not good enough. What if you just have sex and have an illegitimate child? And he said, I swear never even to touch a woman. And so the gods, seeing how sincere he was trying to help his father and how he's willing to give up all things in the world, his throne, any hopes for love as well, not only the throne, but any hopes for love in this world, gave him the blessing or the, the blessing, the boon, that he could only die when he chose to. Nothing could kill him. He could only die when he chooses to. So at the end of the Mahabharata, he's like literally riddled with arrows. And he's laying there, and he goes, well, I want to wait until the sun goes north before I die. So he just hangs out for a few months with lots of arrows in him, waiting for an auspicious time to die, so his soul can ascend back to the Deva realms and be happy. So Bhishma has only the one power of choosing the moment of his death. And he's the ego. The ego has that similar power. The moon which holds the ego, has the power of choosing when it will die, when it will give up the I and the mind. And when it gives up the I and the mind, then God's will flows through it, and then there's free will. Every other type of will, whenever you say I and mind, is just following the dictates of your horoscope. You have to surrender the I. You have to kill, let the ego die. The only will you have as an individual being, the only power, is to surrender the I, to give up the ego. And when you do that, God's will flows through that. Okay? So, how does that work in a practical way? How, how are ways that we can give up the I and therefore let God's will flow through us? There's lots of ways, luckily. Okay? A real simple way is remedials. This is why remedials work. Okay? When you give up your power for the power of God, free will will flow through you. That's how remedials work. So when you wear a gemstone, you're admitting to yourself, I do not have the power to have what I want in my life. Therefore, wearing this gemstone, I'm giving my power up to God. Now the gemstone is going to dictate my fate. And what is the gemstone? It's a piece of nature. What is nature? A manifestation of God. So by wearing a gemstone, one essentially gives up the I, and a little bit of God's will will flow through that gemstone. How much? Not a whole lot, but enough to help, right? Okay. When a person goes down to do a mantra, when they do that mantra, they're saying, all right, God, I can't do this. So I'm asking you to take care of the situation. I'm asking you to take care of things because I can't. In that, you're saying, I can't. The minute you say, I can't, and you appeal to God, whether through nature as a gemstone, through sound as a mantra, whatever method you want to do, through kindness by giving charity, then... God's will can flow through you and your life will get better. So for instance, if you're having financial troubles, the best thing to do is to give away 10% of all the money you get. That sounds crazy. Wait a minute. I'm broke. I'm not making enough money. I can't feed my kids. So to fix that problem, I'm going to give 10% of everything I make to some charity. Okay? And you give that 10% away and you get more money. Why is that? Because in giving away that 10% to some charity, you're saying, God, I can't take care of myself. Here I am broke. Since I, and I'm proven I can't take care of myself, that only you can take care of me by giving away 10%. So the only way I'm going to be taken care of is if you miraculously take care of me. 
Because I can't do it. And I'm proving that by giving away the little that I have and tossing it, giving it to some charity. And in doing that, one gives away my power to survive. So instead of saying, geez, I have to make all my money, I have to keep it all, I have to collect it all, I have to count every dollar, instead I'm saying, I'm not responsible for my money, God is. I'm going to prove it by giving my money away. And then more money comes. Okay? It works every time. The best thing you can do for poverty, for financial trouble, is to give away 10%. I remember once I was in L.A., I was so broke that month, I didn't eat for three weeks, okay? Most of what I ate the rest of that month was wild herbs and we, you know, weeds, you know, edible herbs and things that grow on the side of the road. I was literally getting my lunch on the side of Sunset, of Sunset, um, Drive, or Sunset Drive in the Pacific Palisades, riding my bike between the temple and my house. I still had a roof over my head. I wasn't homeless. I had a little apartment that was killing me at 450 a month. And by little, I mean a 10 by 12 foot room. And, um, and I was totally broke. And I was broke because I had my mind on other things and I wanted to figure out some things. I figured, geez, I don't, my, my job had just gone down the tubes. I was working with some Japanese guys and they disappeared on me and I spent all my money setting up some business with them and I was broke going through a whole bunch of heavy stuff, and I rather wanted to figure out the heavy stuff. So I wasn't really into getting a job, and so I just kind of fasted. And after a while, I got to end the month, and I was like, oh my gosh, I do not have money for rent. I've got, I've got $170, and rent is due tomorrow, or the next day in two days. I got $170, bucks, and um, I need $450. So I said, well, Ah, screw it. I'm just going to give 10% of my how much I made this month. And I calculated how much I made that month, or the previous month, and I had made 700 bucks. So I said, okay, I'm writing a check for $70 to this church. Wrote the check for 70 bucks, tossed it in the mail. Jumped on my bike, literally, the same day, like within an hour. I jumped on my bike for my daily bike ride. And usually I'd either head left, down to Santa Monica, or head west down to Malibu and go on a swim, or I'd hang right and go mountain biking up in the mountains. On this day, I wanted to go to the beach. So, at the corner of where my house left on the Sunset Boulevard, I was about to turn left, and all of a sudden this cold gust of wind came up. I'm like, whoa, it might be a little chilly to actually jump in the ocean today. I think instead, I'll go right, and the wind came from the, le came from the left, blew to the right, I said, I think I'll go right, and instead I will go, um, you know, I'm going to go on a bike ride up in the mountains and go mountain bike riding. So I go mountain biking, and once I'm up there, I, I meet some guys at a gate, and so I kind of hold the gate open for them, or they hold the gate up for me, and we start talking a bit, and I had this really cool high-tech fork on my bike that nobody even knew existed yet, that I was getting set to send to Japan when all that Japanese stuff fell out, and he commented on my fork, and he had a tandem bike, a two-person bike, and he wanted a, a this really unique kind of fork. And this was the only one strong enough to work on a tandem. He'd never seen it. I said, yeah, this is strong enough to use on a tandem. And I'm like, if you want it, I can sell it to you. And he's like, well, how much? I'm like, well, 350 bucks. That's the wholesale on these. This is a $600 fork. I'll sell it to you for 350 <coughs> So he was happy about that. And, um, so I said, okay, I'll come over tomorrow and I'll put it on your bike for $350. So you, you get doing the math. I had $170. <coughs> I gave $70 bucks to the church, which was 10% of what I'd made the previous month. And I just sold my fork for $350. I now had $450, which is how much my rent was. <coughs> so the next day I went to his house. I put his fork on. He was really happy. He gave me an extra $50 bucks that we didn't agree upon. To um, you know, an extra fifty bucks to cover my time of putting the fork on, and I had fifty dollars for food, and my rent was paid just in the nick of time. So tithing works, you know, giving ten percent when you're in dire poverty need works because you're telling God, obviously I can't take care of myself, so you're going to have to step in and do it. <coughs> you're surrendering that I, all remedials, prayer. Um, 
mantras, charity, wearing gemstones, are all saying, I do not have the power. Admitting to oneself that I do not have the power. I'm useless. I can't do it. The moon, the jiva, the ego, can't do anything to affect change here. But by stepping out of the picture, God can step in, and then free will, which is God's will, will flow through us. You have to get rid of the eye. Of course, meditation, severe spiritual practices, all these things, um, are also ways that the I becomes less. But then you'll say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like it's making sense. Because there's all these super spiritual people and they, they suffer. They're not in love, they don't have, they're not married, they don't have children, they don't have money, they're not even healthy. And all they do is meditate and devote their life to their spiritual life. <coughs> and you're like, this doesn't make sense. I don't want to get rid of the I. Because look what happened to these really spiritual people. Well, that's different. Because those spirit, those people are not doing remedials. They're not getting rid of the I. They're trying to embrace God. And through that, the I dissolves itself. But they're not getting the I out of the picture so that God's will can flow through them. They're uniting with God's will. And that's their only goal. And when one is in the state of evolution where it's time for them to begin uniting with God, to become one with God through meditation and through spiritual experiences. At that point, there's no need to change anything in the world. Why? Because changing something in the world is just trading one illusion for another. It's saying, I don't like God in the form of my puppy. Instead, I want God in the form of this big, beautiful supermodel. You know, it's like stupid. You're changing the illusion of a puppy for an illusion of a supermodel. So say you're this lonely person, the only love in your life is your puppy, but you really want Angelina Jolie. It's just changing one illusion for another, right? The puppy is a manifestation of God. Angelina Jolie is a manifestation of God. Your crippled, sick, and decrepit wife is a manifestation of God. So what's the difference? What's the, there's no difference between a healthy wife and a sick wife. There's no difference between health and disease. It's all manifestations of God at that level. And people who are truly aspiring to God connection for that full spiritual realization of oneness with God, it's not worth their time to change anything or care about anything in the world. Because they understand that whether it hurts, whether the thing brings me pleasure, or whether it brings me pain, the thing in front of me is God. Therefore, whatever it is, it is. I don't care. And so they truly embrace their faith. And they let the fate work itself out on its body, but they don't suffer from their fate, because whatever the fate is, whatever form it comes in, it comes as a manifestation of God. And the truly spiritual people see it as a manifestation of God. They don't say, okay, this cancer which has eaten me and causing me pain is a manifestation of God, and therefore it doesn't matter. Or this fire which is burning my house and I'm stuck in my attic and which is going to burn me is a manifestation of God, so it's okay. They're not trying to convince themselves of that fact. They see it as a manifestation of God. It's like some of those, um, Alexander the Great traveled with the yogi. When it was the yogi's time to die, he walked into a fire. And he just sat there smiling while the fire burnt him. Okay? The fire was just a manifestation of God. It was the manifestation of God that was freeing his consciousness from his body. But because he truly saw it as a manifestation of God, the fire caused him no pain. Okay? So, the reason people who are truly spiritual don't have these great material lives and aren't in love and all this junk, is because it makes no difference to them. Okay? They're connecting with God. That's the only thing important to them. They see everything in their life as an aspect of God. So what's the difference? Why change anything if everything's an aspect of God? And that's really the, truly the best way to look at life. Because then you have happiness always. As long as you want happiness from certain things and disdain other things, you're going to suffer. Okay? <clears throat> but even while you're doing those things, you can improve upon your fate by getting rid of the I. By giving the ego, letting go of the ego power and letting God's will flow through us. And that has to be done carefully. You don't tell God what to do, okay? Because that's thinking that you can bully God. I'm going to go bully God. God. 
It's a story about, a good story that illustrates that as a guy who needed a car. So I said, I want a Volkswagen. So he went to God and he goes, I need a Volkswagen. Give me a Volkswagen, God. Please, 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 I need a Volkswagen. So God said, here's your Volkswagen. You have my Volkswagen. And said, I was going to give you a Mercedes. Okay? That's a bad deal. He could have had a Mercedes. If he just sat there and said, I can't manage my life right now. You know, I, I can't get to work. I can't feed my kids. I have no power in this world. Then God says, okay, now that you admitted that and your ego is out of the way, I can step in and give you a Mercedes. Okay? At a great deal. That's never going to break down. But you just say, I want a Volkswagen. I get a, want a Volkswagen. Give me a Volkswagen, God. God might give you a Volkswagen, but in six months it might break down. So, it's the ego has no power. That's the key to understand about changing your faith. Only God has that power. By letting go of the ego, getting the ego out of the picture, which is realization that we have no control over our fate or our life, that's when God can step in. And we have to demonstrate that, though. But we demonstrate it by giving charity. We demonstrate it by wearing a gem. We demonstrate it by... Um, <clears throat> we demonstrate it by um, doing mantras, by praying. And in all those ways, we're demonstrating that I'm getting rid of my ego, and then God steps in, because we let him. Now, there's another part of free will. That's the remedial part. The other part of free will is self-effort. This is the part of free will that therapists and psychologists and neurolingual programmers and healers, all those people like. That of self-effort. Now, when you think of I, which is the sin of the ego, you go I. Right now, think of I. Okay, I am 6'2", blue eyes, hair down to here, wearing a black shirt, with, okay, for one of the first time, not too much pain in my body. A little bit here, Okay, this is the I I'm, I see now. This is I. And this I, this ego, is a concrete thing. This is how we see ourselves. And the I likes to keep seeing itself the way it is and always will be. And that's why the I, which is the moon, represents the conditioned consciousness. It's the, the moon is the conditioned consciousness. I know you can't read this, but I'm going to horrible writing. And I'm not going to use my free will to improve it right now. So, the I is the conditioned consciousness. It's what we're comfortable with. It's what we're used to, and it's what we see ourselves as, and it's what we see our life as. And that's a concrete thing. It's conditioned. It's used to being that way, and it wants to stay that way. That's why people get habits and behaviors that they stick with throughout their lives even though they don't serve them well. Okay? Self-effort is reconditioning um, the I or reconditioning the conditioned consciousness. Which means it's using the strength of our will to kill the I that we're not happy with. And then an I that we're more happy with develops. Okay? That's the second use of the moon's will. Killing the ego. So, I'm a grumpy old bastard who is impatient with everybody. That's me. That's the I. And as a result, I have no friends. I'm a hypothetical person here. I have no friends and no chance at love. Because who wants to fall in love with a grumpy person, right? So, that's the I. That's the conditioned consciousness that the person's comfortable with and which they're going to put, the face they're going to put on wherever they are. But then they'll say, I don't like that I. I don't want to be grumpy. That's my ego. My ego is a grumpy old bastard. So I'm going to recondition that ego, and I'm going to recondition it by being nice every time I have the chance to be nice. And I'm going to take my time to spend the proper time with everybody I meet. I'm going to make myself do that. And then the behavior changes, and then that I, the grumpy I, is dying. 
Because the only power the ego has is to kill the I. And the other way it kills is by self-effort. Killing that I and allowing a new I, a new ego to develop. And then killing that I and letting a new ego develop. And if one kills the I every time using their will, 25, that means 25% of their life is under the governance of their free will to embed better things, and God will respect that and give us three times the amount back and fix that other 75% too. That goes in line, that's a really critical thing for dealing with your fate, because most of what is fate, 99% of the things that happen in your life as fate, as things in your horoscope, are a result of your behavior. Are you lonely? There's a 90% chance it's because of how you behave. Okay? You don't have enough money? It's a 90% because of how you behave or what you believe about yourself. And anything you're unhappy with, 90% of the reason, meaning the majority of the reason, because you see yourself that way and therefore you get it, and you have a behavior and action that guarantees you get it. Okay? And because you choose to do things that don't get it for you. Basically, your habits and behaviors and choices create the fate that you have. So every planet that's creating a predictive event in your life is also a bunch of choices coming together. And habits and behaviors, good behaviors, bad behaviors, good habits, bad habits, good choices, bad choices, to create that event that you walk into one day. Or that you don't walk into but want to. Like you want to walk into a love event and it never happens. It's because of your choices. By using your free will to make different choices, to do, make the right choices, every time you can change your fate. Okay? There's a little bit of fate, which Rahu and Ketu, the other planets we haven't talked to that are critical for fate. Uh, let's see. Rahu and Ketu, these two guys, they're the fatalistic planets, meaning these planets represent fated events the power of which is so focused and so intense, there is no escaping them. There just isn't any escaping those events. Those events are the result of an alignment of all your conscious forces, all your actions and behaviors, essentially all the five elements, plus your need to grow as an individual and your need to grow spiritually, coming together to life-changing times that are required for you to burn the most intense karmas and proceed spiritually, and which are required for you to grow spiritually in all other ways as well. You cannot escape them. Those are truly fatalistic things. But the rest of the planets, the fate of all those other planets represent, are all mutable in accordance with your behavior. So if you come to me for a prediction, I say you're it's not looking like you're going to get married ever because Venus is influenced by the moon and Saturn's with Venus too. I'm going to say, I'll also explain how your behaviors and choices guarantee that fate so that you can replace that ego consisting of those behaviors and those choices with a working ego that can help you achieve your hopes and desires. Okay? So 90% of your fate is truly changeable through change of behavior. And you have to do it 100% of the time. You can't be nice half the time. You can't do pujas for wealth and then cheat everyone you come across and expect to be wealthy. Okay? You can't. If you've got financial trouble in your chart, if you want to completely cure your financial trouble, you have to be honorable with finances 100% of the time, use all your free will for that 25%, and then your finances totally turn around. You can't do pujas and cheat people, because that's not 100% of good free will, right? That's only a little bit of good free will. All right, so self-effort is a critical part, and a good astrologer will also help you apply self-effort towards your goals, rather than just leaving you with a dire prediction. Because let's face it, if you have to come to an astrologer to ask if you're going to be married, if you're going to have kids, if you're going to be famous, usually you're asking because you're desperate because if you're going to have money, you're desperate because those things haven't happened. 
which means they're probably not going to ever happen really good. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking. If you have to ask, there's a 90% chance the answer is not one you want to hear. So you also need to hear why. What are the behaviors that are getting in my way? What can I do to behave in a way that changes my fate? And sure, you won't be able to change that itsy bitsy parts of fate indicated by Rahu and Ketu, which is where every being of your consciousness comes together to create a faded, a truly faded incident. But the majority of your life is totally under the sway of your free will, of self-effort and God's will flowing through you. And even self-effort is God's will flowing through us. That's the natural progression of things, to evolve, for the ego to die and to be reborn in a healthier, more whole state. And that happens through the process of self-effort. So those are the two ways to manage our fate. Uh, be, and the, really the only one way is because we surrender the I. We give up the ego. We either, get, we either acknowledge that the ego has no power, so that God's will can step in and empower our lives, or we acknowledge that this ego is not working, therefore I'm going to consciously kick its butt with better behaviors, with better attitudes, with a better image of myself. And that anyone who's a good therapist, whether it's a love therapist, a therapist that helps her, actually there's one woman I heard about recently, she charges 5k for a makeover weekend, where she'll take four women for a weekend and make them over so they can attract men. And during this, four, this weekend, these women get a whole new self-image. They see themselves in a completely different light, and because they see themselves in a different light at the end of their weekend, they'll go out there and all of a sudden they start attracting men who actually are serious about them and want to marry them. Before the makeover, their, the way they saw themselves, their current state of their ego, which is how we see ourselves, were so low, no man would want to marry them. Okay? So through self-effort, through letting the current ego die, and creating an ego that works for what you want in your life, is also um, the destruction, the death of the ego. The only thing the ego can do is choose when it's going to die. And that's what you have to do if you want to access free will. Free will of self-effort or the free will to get out of God's way. And then your life will improve. And you don't need to know astrology to do that. Knowing astrology and getting your horoscope read can fine-tune the best remedials, can fine-tune the best self-effort because of the specific ways that you're behaving that are ruining your chances at love or whatever, or that are causing you to constantly choose the wrong type of person in your life. Understanding all that will help. But honestly, if you just take time to reflect and think on those things, it's pretty obvious. You know, if you're a grumpy, controlling, angry person, what behaviors do you think need to be changed? Your grumpiness, your anger, and your control issues, right? You don't need an astrologer to tell you that. The main reason people come to astrologers is because they want to live with all the bad choices, the bad behaviors, and the bad attitudes, and they still want the awards. They want to be grumpy, selfish, and controlling, and in love. Uh -uh, it's not going to happen. Honestly, most people come to me and say, love's not working, I don't have love. So I'm like, well, it's because you're controlling. You're so needy, any man's going to be constricted with you. Okay? Or, you, you constantly pick someone way beneath you. It's always something that they're doing that guarantees a lack of love in their lives. You cannot do certain actions. You cannot fall in love with a useless being and expect to get loved by him. If you're with a man who's not useful and productive and helpful in his world, and you fall in love with him, you cannot expect him to treat you well, because he doesn't have the ability to do so. Okay? But yet, women will fall in love with that type of man over and over again, and want to be loved. But it ain't going to work. So, common sense and some introspection will help you see, okay, how are my choices wrong? How are my behaviors not right? You're, if you don't have what you want, 90% of the time is because you want something, but you want to behave in a way that guarantees you don't have it. Seriously. End of story. 
So, if you don't like your fate, figure out what it is, the behaviors you have and the attitudes you have that are guaranteeing your fate to be bad. And then just ask yourself, am I willing to give up this behavior in order to have this? Am I willing to give up being controlling to have love? You know? Am I willing to give up selfishness to really have a 20 year, 30, 40 year relationship? And you know what? A lot of people will say, no, I'm not. A lot of people will say, no, I'd rather be selfish and go through 10, 15 relation, short relationships in the next 30 years than to really live for a relationship and be unselfish. But it's important that, that's, that you understand your choices because it's your choices that are creating your fate. If you don't like your fate because your choices are not giving you the fate that you say you want. So then step, analyze yourself. Do you really want that fate? Is that fate really worth giving up? The things required by that. Because it's not always, oh, I have to give up my selfishness. It might just be, I have to give up my freedom to climb any mountain any day that I want, any day of the year. Is that worth a marriage? Well, is it really worth it? Those things are contradictory. Okay, you're a super spy, right? How's that going to work with your marriage? Reason James Bond didn't get married, right? Or once and his wife got killed on his honeymoon, right? So, we have to understand that we can't have our cake and eat it too. And our choices create our fate. And if we don't like our fate, we have to decide if our choices are worth changing to have that fate. And lots of times you're going to say, you know, it's really not. Given the way things work, I prefer to go without this in order to have this. But once you understand that, and a good astrologer will help you see that, they'll say, well, it's your need to really focus on your career that is ruining your chance of true love. And you'll say, yeah, I guess that's true, but when it comes down to between this and that, I'm going to choose this. Another person might say, it's your love in your life that's keeping you from really focusing on your career. You can't have both right now to the level that you want to. You either have to compromise both or choose one. What's it going to be? And when we understand our choices, we can live at our lives with peace. Understanding that it's this way because of how I've decided it was going to be. Whereas the tendency, people come to the astrologer and they go, it's not fair. I can't find a girl who'll stay with me in a relationship because I'm always going to Nepal every other week to climb a mountain. I don't get it. That's just, I want a nice girl and I want to love her and I want her to love me, but it doesn't happen because I'm always going to Nepal. And you're like, well, you can't have your cake of Nepal and, and eat it in the shape of your wife, which is again a be. Are you going to cut back and not be the best climber in the world and get married? Or you're just going to keep climbing and do one well. You can't do them both at that level. So, and when they understand that, a person will go, okay, I'm going to make this choice for now because it's what's most important to me. And then have a fulfillment in one area. An interesting thing about faith, <clears throat> free will, and enjoying all the things in the world. Like I said, it's through the five elements that we enjoy all the things in the world because the five elements give us our senses. They also give us the powers to act and behave. God created this universe so the soul could come down with a desire and fulfill that desire. And after fulfilling that desire, the this, this soul feels tranquil, having experienced something, and gladly moves on to his next existence. And that's the way life is meant to be. That's the way the lives of great people are. They know what they want, they do what it takes, and they sacrifice what it takes, and they achieve something great. And then they die in a tranquil way. The average person, on the other hand, they want this, they want this, they want this, they want this, they want this. So they're running around in so many directions, they never fully succeed in any one thing. As a result, they achieve no tranquility, and they're reborn with thousands of un, uh, with hundreds of unrealized desires that they want to fulfill. Okay, and that's how astrology works. It's impossible to have a horoscope where you get your cake and eat it too. Those horoscopes don't exist. The way the planets work, some planets are friends to others, and other planets are enemies to others. So the planets that are friends to each other, this planet can do its thing, and while it's doing its thing, it'll help its friend do its thing. And both those planets are happy. 
But then there's also planets that are enemies of each other, which means when this planet influences this planet, when this planet does his thing, this planet cannot do his thing. It's the choice. And people follow the choice of the strongest planet. The choice of love or the choice of career. In one person, the love planet's stronger, they choose that. Another planet, it's this, and they choose that. So because some planets or enemies are to each other, you can, there's just certain things, depending on your charts, individual for everything, that require a choice of letting go of something, of giving up something, in order to achieve something else. You cannot fulfill all your desires on earth in one lifetime. So you need to f find what's most important for you to achieve right now and put your whole being into that. So you can succeed in one thing and have one jewel of happiness. People who dance around juggling trying too many things, I want love, I want to be an artist, I want to meditate and be liberated, and they're doing all those things in a half-assed fashion, have a half-assed realization. They have poor realization in love, poor realization as an artist, and poor realization as in their spiritual realization. Find one thing and master it and achieve and that will give you the strength to quickly achieve the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the chart works like that. You cannot have everything you want in your life. Nobody does. But the happy people are the people that focus on what's most important to them and realize that achieving that is greater than the sacrifices they make. Okay? All right. So enough on fate and free will and how to master our fate through the use of our free will. But again, free will is not ego will. Free will is killing the ego and letting God flow through it or killing the ego through self-effort to create a new you. Which again will become limiting and limited and you'll have to recreate that ego after destroying it. Killing the ego is the only way to align oneself with free will. The ego has none except to choose when it's going to allow itself to succumb to death and powerlessness. So they can be replaced by a, something more beautiful, more capable, or by a greater power, which is God. End of story. It's just that simple.